I think of those beers being big in Belgium. Can I say it again? Those beers being big in Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Mosaic of China, a podcast about people who are making their mark in China. I'm your host, Oscar Fuchs. I'm going to keep today's intro short, since the interview itself starts with a nice introduction of today's guest, Sean Harmon. I'll be back again at the end of the episode with information about a discount for listeners, so you'll want to stick around until then. Also, just two things to mention. At some point in the interview, we referred to the King Albert Fund. That's a mistake. We should have said the Prince Albert Fund. And also, the definition of craft beer in the US has changed since we recorded this. It's now anything under six million barrels. That's it. Let's start the show. Well, thank you so much for coming in, Sean. Thanks for having me, Oscar. And what is your full title? My full title.、Um... Well, my name is Sean Harmon, and I'm the <laughs> general manager of Duval Mortgat China. Say that again, Duval. Duval Mortgat. Mortgat, right? That <laughs> is what language? <laughs> That's actually Flemish, so it's a Belgian company. Okay, and you specialize in what product? For anyone who does not know,、uh, beer, specialty beer. Okay, we're having a beer episode. <laughs> we are, <laughs> and I should basically volunteer the information pretty quickly that I'm not a beer drinker. I know, I know. <laughs> It's sad, but we can't we can't win them all, you know. Well, let's start in the same way that I start every episode, which is: What is the object that you've brought in that, in some way, exemplifies your life here in China? I brought in a bottle of Vedette Extra White. Okay. I wanted to be less cliche with what I did, but I couldn't. I couldn't think of anything <laughs> that was more representative of my China experience.、Um, so this little bottle of Vedette Extra White is actually what took me. All over China over the past eight years,、uh, helping to grow the Duval Mortgat business here. It's our best-selling product for our company in China,、um, and it's been the real growth engine throughout my eight-year tenure. So, it's a big part of my story. And actually, you'll see here this bottle in particular has your face on the back, dude. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. So that- that's one of the, the special things about Vedat is that、uh, each bottle has a consumer's face on the back. So you can go on to the Shao Cheng Shu on WeChat and upload your photo and get a customized <laughs> six pack or twenty four pack、uh, sent to your house. So a gift for you, even though you won't drink it.、Uh, I'm sure you know some people who will kindly enjoy it. I absolutely do, <laughs> and it's not about the drink itself at this point. It's about my ego, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so you might not have fed my stomach, but you're feeding my ego. <laughs> I'm glad I could feed something. <laughs> Well, look. It's not to say that I don't drink beer. It's just like it's something which is always like in the background for me. I would never choose it as a drink myself. But when I have it, I do enjoy it. And I have had your beer, so please don't castigate me. I have drunk your beer. <laughs> no problem. No problem. The market is big enough here. There's enough consumers for us to target. We'll let one slide. <sighs> okay. Good. And have you always been a beer drinker? I have always been a beer drinker. So when I tell my friends, or when my friends first found out that I was going to work for a beer company, they all found it quite interesting because I'm a beer guy, and they know it very well. So it was destined to be. It was destined to be. <laughs> well, what is the beer market in China? Well, China is the largest beer market in the world in terms of volume. Oh, really? So it's huge.、Um, first and foremost, one in four beers in the world are consumed in China. In terms of profit, it's actually only number three. Because the price here of beer is quite cheap. I mean, and number one brand here is Snow. Oh right. But you're buying a Snow at what three or four RMB a bottle. So,、mm. and that's from I would guess a pretty low start because historically China wouldn't have been a beer drinking country, right? Historically,、uh, it's a it's a spirits country. It's a Baijiu country. Yeah.、Um, but they do like their beer. The market actually is is declining slightly every year. As are beer markets all over the world.、Mm. But what is a nice trend, especially for us, is that. Super premium beers or specialty beers, as we like to call them, are growing very nicely. So the macro trend doesn't really affect our、uh, niche sector so much. Oh, interesting. So had I been interviewing somebody from a more mass market brand, like I'm guessing what a Heineken, a Budweiser, what what, what are these brands we're talking about? So the biggest brand in China is China Resources, the company that owns Snow. I think their global headquarters is in Hong Kong.、Mm. Um, but they have offices all over the place. I'm not sure where their CEO of China sits, to、mm. be honest with you.、Mm. They're big. ABI, of course, a,、uh, AB InBev is a, a major beer player. They own roughly a third of the beer consumed in the world. Right.、Uh, and then Carlsberg as well is a big player. Heineken actually joined 
China resources in China. Those are the big three that we, well, the big two we look at in our company really is AB InBev and Carlsberg. But they're so much bigger than we are. It's totally different uh, scales. Right. Yes, because there's been so much consolidation, and not just in beers, but also wines and spirits and the whole alcohol market. But you as a company, you have remained pretty small, right? I mean, relatively, uh, Duval Mortgat is a family-owned company. So established in 1871, the CEO today, named Michelle Mortgat, is the fourth generation of the family. So the company now is around 500 million euros in gross turnover, and that's doubled in the last five years, which is which is incredibly impressive. Oh, wow. Um, the brands we sell in China are uh, Duval, Vedette, Le Chouf, Firestone Walker, Maretsu, and Leafman's. Those are our focus brands here. He's doing his job well. He's got that all off the top of his head. <laughs> I believe it's you. You are the GM. <laughs> <laughs> you said it's a Belgian beer. Like That has a connotation, right? Because Belgium, the beer culture there is pretty famous. It's a tiny country, but it has a lot of beer brands. Right? Have, you, have you been to Belgium? I've been to Belgium. I mean, that's, that's, that's actually quite sad that you've been to Belgium, but you are not a beer guy. Um, <laughs> I'm a waffle guy. Does okay, that count? Okay, there you go. I mean, there's enough great waffles and chocolate as well. Uh, no, I mean, it's an incredible country with a very rich beer history, uh, a lot of breweries that have been around for hundreds of years, and the people really do respect the craft, which is something that I, I really appreciate about working for a Belgian company. Craft beer now, especially in the U.S., is a huge trend, but Belgian beer... It's actually the original craft. Uh, before craft beer was was a thing, Belgian beer was there doing it uh, first and foremost. Well, what does it even mean then? What does craft beer mean? That's a complicated question. In China especially, I mean, the, the translation for craft, all sorts of companies are claiming now. So you have wheat beers that are considered craft. You have uh, obviously IPAs. Anything that's non-lager in China is often called craft beer. Globally speaking, I think it's something that is really focused on the quality of the product. Quality is the most important thing, and they're selling not the traditional uh, standard product, which makes up the vast majority of the market. So lager beer, filtered lager, is 90 plus percent of the market, um, and we are doing the, the other stuff, the specialty stuff that's, that's a little bit different. So it's not actually about the scale, because in my mind, craft beer, I just think of the microbrewery and, you know, here's my little brand, which I've come up with. It's not about that. Well, in the U.S., they have defined it, and that's a brewery uh, doing less than 2 million barrels until you can be considered one of the craft brands. But that term doesn't necessarily translate globally. So in Belgium, uh, that, that's obviously not the case. That's why I prefer to use the term specialty beer because I think it's more encompassing of what, what really matters, and that's the fact that the product is really special. And in China, of course, it's, uh, it's all very, very new. So it's a very complex question that seems very simple. <laughs> what is the story of the company in China? It was started um, in 2006, technically. The first container arrived in 2007, which at that time for Belgian beer was extremely early. Uh, perhaps too early. Um, <laughs> it took a long time to build the volumes up, but that for sure gave us uh, a very distinct uh, first mover advantage. And it was um, my boss till today and my first boss named Vincent Smets. He came over actually on a government grant. It's called King Albert's Fund. And his goal was to do a market study of one year on the potential of the specialty beer industry in China. He completed that study. He said, you guys should definitely open an office and you should hire me to do it. <laughs> and, uh, That's a smart conclusion. <laughs> it was a smart conclusion, and, and he did an excellent job. I mean, he, he from the very early years, he was a, a one-man kind of Spartan operation. Mm. Um, and then slowly but surely, we grew. I joined in 2012. That was here in Shanghai. And what was interesting about us, we did our own distribution, um, which for many brand owners, that's a, it's a very rare approach. But at the time, I think we were so early that the distributors didn't want our beers. Our beers were too expensive. They were too strong. They tasted funny. You know, people didn't get it. So it took time for that to kind of catch on and the market to change. So we decided to basically create our own distribution network. We were delivering the beer to the bars. We were doing the sales. We were collecting the money. Uh, it was a very, <laughs> very labor intensive uh, time in the, in the company's uh, history. I mean, it sounds like a startup and that's what it was. It was very much so a startup and it was a startup culture as well. So when we would open a new office, for example, we would hire someone and this person would do 
all facets of the business. On their own, they would get on a three-wheel bike and uh, <laughs> drive the five cases of beer to the bar and deliver it themselves, even go install the draft machine, clean the beer lines. Um, so that was the early years. And, I, and still today, you'll have a bar owner come up to you and say, I remember back in 2010 when you had a Laowai here delivering the cases to my door. And we got a, definitely a, a name in the specialty market for being so hands-on, so on the ground. Yeah. And totally visible, I guess, as well, especially since like it was a foreigner in one of these more provincial cities right. riding one of those scooters <laughs> full of beer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I exactly. can picture it in my head now. <laughs> Is that how you started in the company? I started a little bit after the most laborious days. Uh, <laughs> right. But yes, I was very much doing uh, a lot of labor aspects of the business. I packed glasses and coasters into boxes when a distributor would order. And yeah, it was fun. It was very fun to look back on. And there's a lot of uh, good times. Well, that's exactly what I sense when you're talking about it. You know, I can see the smile come over your face. I can see your eyes light up. You know, that part of the business, when you're really growing it, the expectations aren't there either. Like, it's almost experimental. You can just play, right? That's exactly right. And you wouldn't think that a global player would start a market like that. They were hands off. They said, you guys go grow the business. If you need something, reach out and we'll try to support you in any way we can. And I think that's what made it work. So we started really in seven core markets. That seems quite a lot, actually. I think for you to regionalize so quickly probably is uh, not what everyone would have thought that you should do. Definitely not. That's actually the key to, I think, the success in the end was that we were on the ground in seven core markets Mm -hmm. and we were well positioned. So when the market did turn and the big guys uh, started investing a lot into their specialty beers, and the trends changed, we were there. And we had boots on the ground, and we had a marketing plan. That's really what I think propelled us the yeah, last eight years or so. Interesting. And because you were so frugal with that mindset, I guess your overheads were kept low. So you were almost like latently waiting, and then you could start pumping in more investment later on. Exactly. Yeah. But that was a challenge as well, I would say, to switch from that mentality of being very frugal to trying to get uh, our team to invest uh, in what they had. So we had a lot of hoarders of, of our promotional items, for example. Uh, what do you mean? We're talking like a neon, a light sign, a okay. glass, a coaster. But some of that stuff is pretty expensive. So in the early days, we were extremely selective. You know, Only the best accounts get a neon. Uh, and now we have KPIs for our sales teams that they need to go out and give out X neons in the quarter. Right. So changing that mentality uh, of our team uh, took some time. That's interesting. Can you think of any other examples from those times? Like, uh, you know, when you would travel around, that cost would add up. But am I right in thinking of you taking like overnight trains or like, how else would you save money? Uh, Overnight, not so much. But we definitely had a very minimal travel expense policy. We always shared rooms. We still do today. We stayed in the cheapest of cheap hotels. So Chi Tian, I don't know if you've heard of Seven Days In or (laughs) I was a Seven Days In member. Chi Tian Huiyan, here you go. (laughs) Uh, stayed in a lot of Chitians. I mean, it's, it's funny, actually, you mentioned that because when we would go to these markets, we were also trying to kind of fake it until you make it. Yeah. Uh, we had to meet distributors. So I would basically take a train to a, a city where I saw that we didn't really have much sales. And I would go around and try to find the bars selling any specialty beer, whether it's Hogarden or Corona, anything that's not Qingdao or, or, or Snow. And I would try to find the guy that sold that beer to them and try to have a meeting with that guy. And <laughs> Oh, I see. So almost like reverse engineer what you saw other beers do. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, because we didn't have the contacts. This is after we kind of shifted from only our own distribution to saying, okay, now we want to expand distribution. Right. So I would arrive in the city, but I didn't want this big distribution company to think we were some tiny startup. So I remember this one in particular city. I would stay in the Chi Tian, which was next to the Shangri-La. <laughs> yes. And... When the distributor would come pick me up for dinner, I would say, just pick me up at the Shangri-La. I'd walk across the street oh. and, uh, <laughs> and wait in the lobby of the Shangri-La. And then he'd drop me off back there at the end of the evening. And uh, <laughs> I love it. Fake it till you make it, you know? Yeah. No, but this is, I mean, this is entrepreneurialism. I mean, when I was starting my company, I used to have this lovely suit and I used to meet at these great hotels just like you did. And then I would like around the corner be eating like a rice snack in the gutter. <laughs> exactly. I don't know if I could do it again, but it was, it was really a, it was a trip. It was a ride. Yeah. Well, you've said then there's been a challenge now to move away from that mindset. And now you do have more budget. 
I guess the stress now is that, okay, you've proven yourself. You've got to a level where you've got this much growth. What's the next stage? And, you know, what's the next pressure point? Is that the period of growth that you're in right now? Absolutely. I mean, the big lager players are investing heavily into the specialty sector. So we must stand our ground. We have to defend our market share, grow our market share. So the, the strategy now is invest, spend, and spend wisely. We don't just spend to spend. We, we try to spend as clever as we can. But in a way, it's a different skill set for you as a GM. I would say it kind of comes naturally somehow. I mean, that's what you do when you're growing is you just rise to the challenge. There's problems every day and you just have to try to attack it, you know, whatever it may be. So marketing is a great example because digital is extremely complex. It's kind of a double-edged sword because it's the best bang for your buck in terms of generating brand awareness. But there's also a lack of transparency. I mean, mm. there's these these influencers, KOLs. There's a lot of fake data. Oh, so, really? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so you have to be aware of what's happening. It, it took some trial and error, for sure. But we learn fast. Let's just define this KOL term. It means? Key opinion leader. So it's an influencer, basically. Right. So in China, like this is what you need to use to promote your brand. You need to find the right opinion leader, right? Well, there's, I mean, there's lots of different ways to invest in marketing, but one of the best channels for sure is through KOLs. Uh, it's just how to do that in a way that you're still efficient and you're not pumping money in to something which actually has, is a follower with 5 million bots instead of real consumers. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah. Which is a very uh, specific, I think, China uh, conundrum. But we've learned a lot over the years in doing digital marketing, and now it's now I would say that we have a lot of KOLs we work with regularly who we've vetted and we know them. They represent our brand. They're basically our brand representatives now, even though they're obviously third-party influencers. But it's very impactful and the reach is incredible. And this is, I mean, I'm guessing the thing that keeps you most up at night. It is the marketing piece. It's the, like, how do you spend that money? How do you even justify it? And how can you track what you're spending has what effect, right? I mean, definitely. That's where our biggest uh, budgets are. I think also innovation is is a big one because I don't drink what my dad drank, right. you know, and my dad doesn't drink what his dad drinks. So the market will change over time, and we're very aware of that. Yeah, you say innovation. It makes me ask, you know, are there any types of beers or flavors that you find here in China that you perhaps wouldn't find elsewhere? Um, in terms of specialty beer, the, the biggest by far is wheat beer. But now in the last few years, we've seen a lot of fruit beer as well. Mm. So we've actually launched, in addition to Vedette Extra White, we've launched a Vedette Extra Rosé, which is white brewed with uh, raspberries. So, I mean, that is a, is a huge trend right now, is to the sweeter, fruity uh, wheat beers and um, other fruit beers. Which strikes me as being a Belgian thing. Like, I think of those beers being big in Belgium. Can I say it again? Those beers being big in Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, wheat beer, I mean, there's a, definitely a history of fruit beer in Belgium. So they had the first advantage, the Belgian uh, fruit beers. But you also have a lot of craft brewers here that are brewing some excellent um, IPAs and, and other uh, unique styles as well. So it's coming. It's just, it's, it's a process. For today, wheat is, is for sure the most powerful sector. And who is your consumer? Like, do you have a particular demographic that you are marketing towards or who just happen to be the ones who like your beer? Uh, it, generally, it's younger people. Mm. I mean, it's early 20s to late 30s. Our female dra demographic is actually quite strong as well. Mm. But yeah, it's young people who are kind of looking for something better. It's affordable luxury. Right, it's, right. It's, this it's, is it because it's a premium beer, but it's not such a huge leap to go from a box standard beer to your beer, right? Right. In a, in a shop, you're buying it 16 to 25 kwai. I mean, it's not uh, going to break the bank but you can appreciate some of the best beer in the world for that uh, affordable price. Nice. And, you know, you have gone through so many changes. What do you see as the future? It's, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think that um, it's so hard to leave China. The growth, the energy, I love the city, I love the people. Yeah, so we'll see. I mean, for now, it's a growth story. Yeah. And why not continue riding that wave while it lasts, right? Riding a wave of beer. <laughs> exactly. That would be a dream to some people, less exactly. so for others. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean. Now let's move on to part two. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Ten questions, let's do it. Are you ready? I am ready. Am I ready? 
Question one: What is your favorite China-related fact? My favorite China-related fact. There's so many. The easiest thing is to do with with the scale of the country.、Mm. This is maybe less true today after COVID, but a few years ago, China's economy was growing at the pace of one Australian economy every year. Oh wow! Yeah, it's always interesting when you make that like for like comparison. Yeah, because you know, your、does. mind can't really understand the scale. Yeah, what does GDP growth mean? No, exactly. It means one new Australia. Yeah, it's a bit like when they say, "Oh, this is like five football fields." Yeah, yeah. You, you can, can conceptualize kind of, a little、yeah. bit. Yeah, exactly. Australia size. <laughs> Question two: Do you have a favorite word or phrase in Chinese? Let's think. I think the one I I, I really like is、uh, it's a phrase, 车到山前必有路 Before the car reaches the mountain, there must be a road, which I think is really relevant here because things are often not that easy. But if you do keep pushing and you keep going for it, usually you will find a way.、Mm. It it really spoke to me when I first heard it, and it's it's simple Chinese. I mean, it's not、yes. complicated. It's not like one of these four character Cheng Yu's, which you have to really, <laughs> <laughs> really know the story behind it. It's very direct and、uh, and it speaks to me, so I love that one. Yeah, and is it fatalism where the road will suddenly appear, or is it that you have to make the road? To me, it says just keep going.、Mm. If you just keep driving, you keep going, the road will go through. I like it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Never heard it. I'm going to use it. <laughs> Please do. What's your favorite destination within China? It's such a big country, so. You've traveled quite a lot, right? I've traveled a lot in China. I've been to、uh, most of the provincial capitals at this point. It's I, there's there's definitely more beautiful places in China、uh, than Mogenshan, but to me, it's kind of a sentimental place. I mean, we've we've had a lot of our annual company meetings there with our management team.、Uh, we cook together, we run together through the mountains, we we do walks, and and we create the new strategy for the new year. I also go there with my friends、uh, on weekends to get out of the city. To me, it has a very special place in my heart. I mean, now it's getting so built up, which is a bit of a yes, shame. Yes. Yes.、Um, People like you keep talking about it, man. I know. I know. <laughs> now I'm sitting here saying it on a podcast, which isn't helping my case, I guess. <laughs> But if you left China, what would you miss the most, and what would you miss the least? What I would miss the most is the energy. I think I mentioned that in our, in our chat. It's it's just so powerful here. If you push and you have a great product and a great plan. And you put it to action, things can happen, and and people work hard, and it's fun, it's addicting that that sort of、uh, that sort of energy where you feel like anything is possible. Then the the other side of that question is is it's got to be the pollution, and it's not only the air pollution. I, I for me, it's also the noise pollution. Oh right, you know that the power drill.、Uh, my boss used to call that the birds of Shanghai because. <laughs> it, it, You don't hear birds that often, but you do hear that power drill、uh, frequently. But those two things that you've said, you don't get this energy, this growth, this movement without the sound of a growing city, right? Exactly, and that's why I'm still here. It, it evens itself <laughs> out. You know, it's all worth it. Is there anything that still surprises you about life in China? I mean, every day, yes, absolutely. That's also one of the things I like so much about living here.、Uh, but recently, top of mind is for sure e-commerce, the power and reach of a channel that's so new. And how quickly everyone, it seems, has adapted to it, regardless of age. I mean, everyone is buying online. It feels like. Okay. Next question. What is your favorite place to go out to eat or drink or just hang out? So I'm a Jing'an guy. I've lived in Jing'an、uh, most of my time in, in in Shanghai. It's a district downtown, and our office is right at the crossroads of、um, Wuding and Zhaozhou, which you know. We were very lucky to choose that location. We moved in there in 2011. At that time, there was no bars on that street,、uh, and fortunately for us, they kind of built the road around us somehow. <laughs> Being a beer company, we have a lot of clients on that street, so we'll pop down to Malabar, have a have a beer there. Malabar.、Um, but there's a lot of places I could mention to go have a good beer. I also love the Rooster. I love、uh, Cafe de Stagiaire, and and but it's countless. I mean,、yeah. being in, in connected to the F and B industry.、So. Yeah. Well, I like Malabar because that has a nice, interesting link to Angie Wu from season one, who said the same bar. So maybe, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Maybe you're going to run into her there. Okay. Yeah, it's a great place. <laughs> What is the best or worst purchase you've made in China? The best purchase I've 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 listened to some of your podcasts, and I, I was really trying to think of something different, <laughs> but there's no better answer than the scooter. I mean, the scooter is oh right. It it shrinks the city.、Mm. I've had a scooter since I first arrived, and it's. It's one of my favorite things to do, just to ride around the city on my scoot. 
my fiance also has a scooter and we we love to cruise it's 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 amazing especially when the weather's nice <sighs> what a beautiful romantic image you're giving me <laughs> actually i'm not even on mo bikes now i just walk everywhere wow yeah what is your favorite wechat sticker okay he's getting his phone out let me just check mine i don't know why i love this sticker but if you talk to my colleagues they will say that i certainly overuse this sticker it's denzel washington in training day and he just says boom i don't know why it just makes me laugh and <laughs> when you get good news at work or something happens ah. where you you know you land an account and yeah to celebrate a bit just give an old denzel boom <laughs> okay i'm gonna use this one that's a great one it's also a great movie if you haven't seen it i haven't seen it check it out it's, it's worth watching <sighs> it's an action movie is it yes but with great dialogue okay I'll do it. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> <laughs> what is your go-to song to sing at KTV? You know, I wish I was a better singer, but I'm not, uh, I'm not great at KTV. I'm not the star of the room by any means. <laughs> I, if I have to sing, and I will sing. I do like the, I used to very much like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and he, he, the range of the, the lead singer, Anthony Kiedis, it does, he doesn't get too high or too low. All right. So it's, it's manageable without completely embarrassing yourself. <laughs> um, maybe... Uh, maybe by the way, if I have to choose one. And finally, what other China-related media or sources of information do you rely on? I was actually just this morning listening to the new uh, Seneca Business Brief. Right. It's a, I think it's a weekly podcast. It's like 20 minutes and it just updates you on kind of all that's happening in the world of China business. I also uh, read Axios on China. Right. Uh, it's a newsletter. In your, in your inbox. It's great. Interesting. So that's a, a, two great sources of uh, China news for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sean. I mean, as I said at the beginning as well, like I'm not a beer drinker. Let's have one beer together and then maybe you can reassess. Done. Okay. Done. And before you leave, let me ask you one final question. Who out of everyone you know in China would you recommend that I interview for the next season of Mosaic of China? So many options. Um, but I think a really cool story is uh, the story of Peddler's Gin Company. Right. Um, A a friend of mine is a co-founder there, Fergus, and they're creating something I think is really impressive. It's it's a great quality product. It's still alcohol industry, but but different. Um, It would be a cool story, I think, for everyone to to learn. That's great. Well, maybe that is the equivalent story in the world of gin as you are in the world of beer. Yeah, it's a startup story for sure. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you, Oscar. It's been a pleasure. So first things first, where's the discount I mentioned? For this one, you'll need to be in one of the WeChat groups for the show. I've posted a special QR code there, which you can scan to open the mini program. And from there, you can then upload a photo to print on a six pack of any Vedette beers, and you'll get a 30 RMB discount voucher on top. Cheers. Also in the WeChat groups and on the mosaicofchina.com website, you'll find the images alongside today's episode, including photos of the Duvel Mortgat team in Moganshan and elsewhere, one of Sean's boss and predecessor Vincent installing a neon, and one of Sean and his fiance out and about on their scooters in Shanghai. Incidentally, there were four people from season one who chose their scooters as their best purchase in China, and one of them was Jorge Lucio, the China Head of Marketing for the Sprite brand at Coca-Cola from episode 5. Sean touched on the topic of digital marketing in today's conversation, but if you want to hear more, please listen to that episode with Jorge. There's also a secret digital marketing connection between Sean and Stefan Ouimet from L'Oréal, who featured in episode 1 of season 2. The secret being that you can only hear that part of Stefan's chat if you are a Patreon subscriber. Here are a few clips from today's extended interview over on Patreon with Sean. We ended up staying in Hong Kong for five weeks with, I think, three cancelled flights. All right. <laughs> We've worked with him this year and, and the scale is unbelievable. 30 million people watching. We've worked with a lot of different live stream sellers and what we've realized is it's the big ones that actually do the trick. We're a young group. I think our average age is around 32. And that's my age as well, so yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> And that's all for today. Mosaic of China is me, Oscar Fuchs, with artwork by Denny Newell. Stick around for the catch-up chat with Simon Minetti from Season 1, Episode 17, and we'll be back again this time next week.
Hello, Simon. Hi. The dulcet tones of Simon Minetti. Mm. How the hell are you? I'm tired. I've been off coffee now for maybe 12 days, and it's hard. And I've been off booze since, just checking my watch, for eight days. And that's less hard, but now it's the weekend, so it's a true test. Ooh, that's right. Mm. So this is a January thing for you, is it? Mm. Yes. And you are visibly struggling. (laughs) Thanks. It is Friday (laughs) afternoon, first week back at work, negative four degrees, so it's a tough time. It is. Well, let's start there then. So you said that it is the end of a long week of work, and that's Mm. one of the changes that I know has happened since our last chat. Mm. Was it not mentioned at all last time? No, maybe not. So I'm now Managing Director of Ritter Sport China, the wonderful German chocolate company that is very well represented in many expat stores in China. (laughs) Um, So it massively over-indexes amongst the, uh, the expat community, but we need to grow among the true heart of China. Things like localizing the brand, uh, getting the portfolio right. And this Ritter Sport family cares very deeply about their impact on the world through the company. The the company they see as something that they was gifted to them through inheritance, and it is their opportunity to do good in the world. So chocolate is actually just a vehicle to do good in the world. And every company you join will tell you you've just joined a family, and they will say they care about you, and that they have a purpose and a vision. But having been on the agency side, I've advised so many of those companies on how to structure their vision and their mission, and it's all so synthetic. Whereas you come to a company like Ritter Sport and you see it, there is an authentic value system driving this company. Um, So that has been an extremely motivating and uh, rewarding experience. So though I look exhausted, um, I'm in a very, very happy place. Nice. But I don't want to go into the chocolate industry. Okay. What I want to latch on to is the word family, because that's another big change that we've had since our recording. What happened? So I have a baby boy, Louis Edward Manetti. Quite a mix of, uh, of culture there. Um, and um, I have a wife that is five months pregnant. Dude! Yeah. Congratulations. Yes. yes. I'm glad that I caught you now before your life gets even more into a turmoil. Mm. <laughs> So, Mm. what were you doing in the last year over COVID? Uh, So, I was off to New Zealand for a wedding over the Chinese New Year period. And then, say, by Feb 6th or so, flights were cancelled and we had to make uh, a new plan. So, ended up with all of our summer gear flying directly into the depths of winter, or I should say the tail end of winter in Europe. Um, and I spent the next nine months in my mother-in-law's polo shirts um, <laughs> because my mother-in-law is the sweetest woman alive. I feel bad about saying it, but honestly, we had the most incredible 2020. Right. We, we were so lucky because we were staying in Talois, which is near Ancy. You're surrounded by beautiful nature. It's France, so the food and wine is spectacular. We were really, really lucky. Yeah. I'm just going back to our original episode Mm. and I'm thinking about what you said about what you would miss the most and miss the least Mm. if you left China and you did leave China. So I wanted just to check on you and to see was that true. So what you said that you'd miss was the optimism of China because whenever you go to Europe, it's all grumpy and negative. And then what you said that you'd miss the least is when the internet doesn't work properly. Mm. Interesting. So optimism... Definitely true. But when you move into the house of another, what I really missed was being able to be selfish and... You know, impolite, basically. Impolite. Um, yeah, I found that challenging and that would kind of build up. And in the end, I didn't get to see so many people because we were in lockdown. So I only saw those immediately around me. So yeah, I can't say that I tested that one. In terms of internet... I actually had a lot of problem getting stable internet in France as well. <laughs> so both of those have been dispelled, really. Interesting. They? Yeah, I was <laughs> wrong. On that note, let me say thank you again for coming in. It's great to see you, to have a catch up. The person you recommended for season two actually couldn't be part of this season, but 
I found a good replacement. So I will be posting this conversation at the end of that episode. Um, but I'm very happy that there is an excuse for us to be in the same room again. And I hope we have another excuse to do it again in the future. Me too. Lies. <laughs>